So we are working in the book of Ruth. So if you'll turn there, it's in the Old Testament. Right after the book of Judges. Right before 1 Samuel. And we're calling this series Disloyalty, Loyalty, and Royalty. And today, the question is, where do you live? Every once in a while, somebody will ask me, where do you live? And I tell them where I live. But we're talking spiritually today. Where do you live? So we're going to pick up in chapter 1. Verse number 6. We talked last week about Elimelech and his family moving out of Israel and moving to Moab and uh, made a bad decision. We talked about that, many decisions actually. Uh, and we're going to pick up here in verse 6 of chapter 1. Then she arose, and we're talking here about Naomi. She arose with her daughter-in-laws to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the, that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Verse 7. <clears throat> so she set out from the place where she was with her two daughter-in-laws, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go return each one of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The dead, of course, being their husbands, which were her sons, and, of course, the, her, her husband, their, her father, their father-in-law. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No. We will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may uh, become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. Verse 15. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, more also, if anything, but death parts from you, parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. <clears throat> Where do you live? This past week was an important week in the life of my dad, who is with the Lord. On Monday the 23rd would have been his birthday, and uh, he had been 97 if he was still here, but he's been promoted. And uh, the Lord took him home in 2003, April 3rd, 2003. Dad served in the Navy, uh, in the CBs uh, in the South Pacific. And uh, when he came home from there, my mom, uh, isn't he a handsome dude? Uh, anyway, uh, I say that because everybody says I look like him. Anyway, uh, so uh, came, he came home from the South Pacific, and my mom uh, told me that he was a different guy. War does that. Our son went to Iraq and came home a different person. And Dad came home a different person not only because of uh, the war itself, but he had suffered a head injury, and uh, it affected his entire life from that day on. Uh, he spent over 30 years in a wheelchair. Uh, not immediately, but later on, because of the head injury. Him and my mom were married for 58 years. And uh, when they first got married, when Dad came home from the war, they were religious. They went to church once in a while. Uh, I won't tell you where they went to church, but uh, it was mainline denominational churches, both of them. Uh, but uh, neither one of them were saved. And... Um, after uh, having my older three siblings, uh, there's nine years between me and 
my youngest, my oldest brother, that's uh, the youngest of the three. Uh, they settled in a house in, outside of Muncie, Pennsylvania, and, uh, uh, and they began to have marital problems. And dad packed up and moved out, and mom was pretty much by herself with the kids. Um, but, don't you like buts in certain places? I like it in the Bible when it says, but God. Amen? Don't you like but gods? Okay. In this case, it's a but God thing. My dad's older brother, um, we called him Uncle Gig. Uh, it's a long story, but my grandmother didn't call any of her children by their right name. And I'm serious. Uh, my dad's name is Charles, and she called him Lamar, which is his middle name. And a lot of people knew him as Lamar. I always knew him as dad. But anyway, um, I could see calling my dad Lamar. I wouldn't be here to preach this morning. But anyway, um, there was a thing called respect. You know what I mean? Anyway, um, so my Uncle Gig, which is two years older than my dad uh, was, and he was pastoring a church in Mentoresville. He had gone to war. All three of my, my, my oldest uncle, my middle uncle, and my dad had all gone to World War II. They were all overseas at the same time. Uh, and uh, then the younger brother was born later, and he went to uh, the Korean uh, conflict. Anyway, so uh, Uncle uh, Gig had got saved uh, over in Europe, and uh, when he got saved, he came home, he went to the Bible college and began to teach and preach a pastor of church in Mentorsville. And uh, so, of course, his goal was to see my parents come to Jesus and everybody else around him. That should be our goal, by the way. If you're ready to meet Jesus today and you know if he comes, you'd fly away today, your goal is to find the rest of people in your family and be a witness and a testimony to them. And uh, so anyway, um, he was constantly talking to my parents and praying for them and witnessing. And on January the 27th, which would be Friday, so see, this is a big important week for my dad. His birthday was on the 23rd, and his spiritual birthday was on the 27th. On the 27th, he was headed towards Muncie on the old one route 147 and he felt the draw uh, of the Lord and he actually testified that he actually heard God speak to him right in his soul and he pulled over on the side of the road on route 147 and got out in the dirt and got down on his hands and knees alongside the car and gave his life to Jesus which drastically changed him so radically changed him that it impressed my mom and um and she, uh, they, they got their marriage worked out and went on. And, of course, mom was his caregiver for many, many years. But it so ra radically changed him. She, was, she couldn't believe what happened because he was totally different. And the uh, interesting part of the story is that uh, dad called mom and said, I'm taking the kids to church tomorrow. Uh, is that okay? And mom's like, uh, yeah. And thinking, what's up? And uh, so she decided <laughs> she was going along. And uh, two weeks later, they both were baptized by my uncle because my dad had got saved along the road and my mom got saved. Uh, how cool is that, huh? So um, what happened, though, in that whole situation was that my dad didn't like where he was living spiritually, and he moved. He moved towards Jesus. He moved that led my mom, of course, to move and become saved. And then, of course, they got baptized and so on and so forth. Dad would have been a Christian 73 years this year if he, would have, if he was still here. But the good news is he's with Jesus. Everything he preached about, and he preached all over the place, and everything he talked about came true, and he got to see it the moment he passed and went into the presence of the Almighty. But he wasn't happy, and he moved. And that's the question today. Where do you live? You'll see how it fits together here in a minute. This whole study is about disobedience, obedience, and blessing. And I told you that before. And so we see these three ladies. They've lost their spouses. It was just the three ladies. And in Bible days, being a single lady pretty much meant you were just of no value. And there they were, destitute in the land of Moab. It's interesting, over in Psalms chapter 60 and verse 8, the Bible refers to Moab as a dishpan. I don't know about the rest of you, but you ever think about living in a sink? Sinks aren't real clean. 
They're hooked to the sewer, in case you ever wondered where your water goes. And the Lord calls Moab a wash basin. Not a pretty picture for these three ladies who really have nothing. Ruth, Ruth and Orpha, or, or excuse me, Orpa, uh, they're natives of Moab, so they might have a little bit of edge on Naomi, who is an outcast. He, she's from Judah. She had no business being there. She shouldn't even have been there. And she needs to get things right and go back to Judah. She needs to repent. We find it right here in our text. Verses 6 and 7 that I read earlier. We find, I told you this last week, we find the word return. And the word return in the original language means repentance. It means to turn around. And it means that she, she did an act of repentance. She turned around and she decided she's going back home. These three ladies' responses to what happens in this text can really have an impact on our relationship with God. And that's why uh, this morning uh, I want to ask the question, where do you live? And you'll see at the end how this all fits together. The first thing I want you to notice in verses 8 through 13 is that Naomi was living in defeat. Living in defeat. I got to tell you if, you, if you're on Facebook, if you're not, praise God, but if you are, uh, and I say that loosely, jokingly mostly, but uh, if you are on Facebook, you've got at least one or two of your friends that is just always negative. Negative Nancy, they used to call them. Just always negative. And as I was reading through the text this week, I tried to read it every day. And as I'm reading, I thought to myself, this could be put on Facebook. Because it sounds like people I know. And here, here is Naomi. She's living in defeat. She's in sin. She's out of God's will. She's backslidden. She knows where the real, where the real place that God wants her is in Israel. That's the promised land. She's left the promised land, traveled 50 miles to Moab. Now she's living as a prodigal. Now she's lost everything as far as her husband and her boys, and she's living in defeat. Look at verse 8 and 9. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal quickly. Uh, or kindly, that phrase actually means may the Lord grant grace is what that means uh, with you as you have dealt with the house of your husband, uh, or excuse me, as you have dealt with the dead and with me, verse 9, the Lord grant that you uh, may find rest. The word rest there means security. She says, you, you need to go. May the Lord give you grace, okay, and may he give you security, each of you, in the house of her husband. So she's indicating here they need to go what? Get married. Okay, they need to go find another husband. And then she kissed them. That's a sign of farewell, farewell. And they lifted up their voices and they wept. And so first thing I want you to notice about Naomi is that she had no hope for the present. She saw no hope for the present. She had nothing to offer to her daughter-in-law. She had nothing for herself, no hope for the present, right where she was at that very moment. Nothing, she has nothing for herself. She has nothing for her daughter-in-laws. And here she is. Uh, the one thing she has is the Lord, but she has ran away from him. Mind you of a guy by the name of Jonah who ran away from God. And she has run out of God's will, and she's in Moab in a pagan worship place that God calls that place an abomination. And here she is. She has no hope. She has no hope for the present, and she has no hope for the future. Verses 10 through 13, and they said to her, no, we will re return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? I have, have I yet sons in my womb that they have become your husbands? <laughs> no, I can't. I can't produce more kids, she says. Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I too am old, uh, too old to have a husband. And if I should say that I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night, and I should bear <clears throat> sons, would you wait until they grew up? So you can marry them. So she doesn't even have any hope for the future. She doesn't have any hope for the present. She has no hope for the future. Hmm. Nothing to offer for the future to these young ladies that are related to her by marriage. She has no hope for herself. And when she says here to turn back, she says to them, you know, you need to turn back. Verse 11. What she really meant was go back to your pagan gods. What? Think about that for a moment. Here's somebody who knows the truth. 
And she says, go back to your pagan gods. And yet sometimes, folks, that's what we do to people that are in our lives that are lost. Because we're embarrassed or we just don't want to take a minute to talk to them about Jesus. So we're saying just keep living like you are. Hopefully somebody else will come along and help you. She said, go back to your evil lifestyle. We talked a little bit of last week about the evil lifestyle they had of all kind of debauchery in Moab. She says, go back there. Who, who would wish this on somebody? Well, Naomi did. She said, go back there and find new husbands. Guess what? If she finds new husbands from Moab, they're going to be idol worshipers. Why would you do that? Because you have no hope. You have no hope for the present. You have no hope for the future. Naomi was actually very busy hindering the work of God. Because Philippians tells us, Paul writing there in chapter 1, verse 27, behave as Christians, worthy of the gospel of Christ, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul says to the Philippians, you need to go out and live in such a way that you are working together to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And here Naomi has two ladies that want to go back to Israel with her, go back to God's land. Judah actually means the praise. Go back. And she's saying, no, you stay here in your dirty old mucky way you are. The more I thought about this, the more I thought to myself, what kind of mother-in-law was she? How sad is this? I don't know about you. I find this terrible. So she had no hope for the present, no hope for the future, and she had no hope in the Lord. Look at verse 13. No, my daughters, for it is extremely bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone against me. She's going back, but she has no hope even in the Lord. She said, you know, the reason I have all this problem is what? Is the Lord. God, God's, God's the problem. You know, you're sitting here maybe this morning thinking to yourself, well, I'm glad I don't think like that. Wait a minute. We do sometimes. And when the things aren't happening the way we want them to, the first person we want to blame is God. And she says, you know what? The Lord is against me. Do you realize this morning that if the Lord was against her, she'd be what? Dead. Yeah, the Lord's not against her. By the way, if you're here today and you're up to your knees in muck of life and you think God's against you, i got news for you. The Lord is not against you. The Lord won't join you in your trials and tribulations and sorrows just to give you a hug, but the Lord will be there to pull you out, lift you up, set you firm on, this, on the rock. See, when we get outside of, uh, out, of, out, of, uh, out of God's will, we begin to see no hope because we're, we're trying to find hope in other stuff. People, places, position, power, prestige, money. If I could just win that billion dollars, I'd have it made. Maybe nobody in the room ever said that out loud, but you've thought something like that. The problem is I don't make enough money. I need to find a job that makes more money. I learned something a long time ago. Unless you are extremely disciplined, the more money you make, the more money you spend. And so, when you're away from God's will, you forget He is your hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So why do we see no hope? Well, first of all, Satan blinds us. The Bible talks about that, that he blinds us. He keeps us focused on, what do you think he focuses us on? me Satan's one of his biggest lies and tricks is to get you to pay attention to you he takes our focus off of what really matters and he, he blinds you by looking at because you know it's interesting that people go to high school reunions and, and they're broken hearted because they're, they're some kid that was a slob in class is doing good uh, now as, an, as a grown-up, and you're struggling. Facebook does the same thing to you if, you're, if you pay attention to what everybody posts on there. 
But Satan's whole goal is to get us to look at ourselves. He distracts us at all the surroundings, the neighbor's boat, the guy up the street built a new house, the person down the road bought this, my brother got a brand new vehicle, whatever it is. And Satan wants you to focus on that. And you live in defeat because your focus isn't on Jesus. And the Bible tells us very clearly in John chapter 8, verse 44, that he lies to us. In fact, Jesus said there he is the father of lies. And so he tells us things like how bad we are, how poor we are, how bad off we are. Everybody in the world is better off than you. And before you know it, you lose hope. And you lose hope in the Lord. And so there she is, Naomi, living in defeat. And then we talk about Orpah. Number two, Orpah is living in departure. She's out of here. She's a picture of a lost person who looks into the things of God, gets a picture of God, and turns back to the life of sin rather than turn to God. This is who this, this lady is. She's got an option. She's got a, a, a way to step out of the bad situation. But she chooses to go back into it. You take drug addicts, you take prostitutes, you take people that are in those lifestyles. Even if they break free, they often, as soon as they have a bump in the road, they go back. She goes back. Look at verse 14. Then they lifted up their voice and, and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to, her, uh, clung to her. Verse 15, and she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people. She departed to her people. She went back to her people. You say, well, that bitch, she's around family and friends. Think about what family and friends are in the land of Moab. They're idol worshipers. They're desperately wicked behaviors. That's what she went back to. She didn't, you know, you remember the old uh, show on TV, Moving Up to the East Side, the little song that played? This isn't what happens here. She goes back to the, where she was, in the muck and the mire. Verse 15 says, See, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. She departed to her worship. She, first of all, departed to her people, then she departed to her worship. The, these words, as I read them and as I've read them this week, hurt my heart because here is somebody that knows better, and that's Naomi who tells her, go back to your gods. What does her gods have to offer? Nothing. Death. Yes, nothing. And she said, go back there. It's interesting. I read this last week over in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 7, uh, where the Bible tells us that Chemosh, that's who they worship. The Bible says that Chemosh was, an, was the abomination of Moab. The abomination turns God's stomach, so to speak. It's an abomination. Verse 15 says, go back to your gods. She departed from her people, or to her people. She departed to her worship, and she departed to her normality. The average thing, what I do every day. This is what I do. Her heart's still in Moab. Many people talk about God. Many people attend church. Many people practice religion, but they're not in Christ, but in the world. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. We have changed and Orpah has not. The Bible tells us the old has passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. That's, but she stays right where she was in the normal life that she had. Her heart's still in Moab, unfortunately. And she stays there. So we see living in defeat. We see living in departure. And we see living in decision. So Ruth makes a decision. I'm going to tell you something. Verses 16 through 18, if you were to take time this week and just sit down and slowly read them and just really look at what it says, if there's anything in this world that we can uh, get excited about in this book, 
it, to this point, anyhow, it's Ruth. Let's look at a couple things. So she's the picture of the lost sinner who looks into the things of God and believes them by faith. She comes to God. She's a real possessor. She, she has decided to be a child of God. She's going to follow godly things. She enters the family of God. She goes to Israel. And the Bible tells us, if you look back in uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, God outlined in those books to Moses, and Moses wrote it down, exactly how outsiders were to be handled in Israel. In fact, a lot of our people now that want open borders are saying, you see, God allowed them to come to Israel. God did allow some of them to come, but there was a way to do it, which, of course, we don't have in our country. Not being used anyhow. But here she is. She makes the decision, I'm going with you. I'm going with Naomi. First of all, we see in verse 16, a decision to follow. Look what she says. She makes the decision to follow, but Ruth said, see the word but? Changes gears. Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to refer, or ref, or return from my following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. She says, listen, I've already made a decision. Don't try to talk me out of it. Because I'm not going to change my mind. It's interesting. If you were to turn back to Genesis and, and study the book uh, or study the story of Abraham, some of the things that happens right here with Ruth happened uh, by Abraham. Abraham did the same thing. Ruth chose to leave her past. Abraham chose to leave his past. Abraham chose, or Ruth chose to leave her family. Abraham chose to leave his family for a place he didn't even know where he was going, but was being led by the Lord. So she left this the Moabites, their behavior, all that, so she could go to the land of promise that God had promised Israel. How important was this decision? You know how important this decision was? Listen carefully. If you don't take nothing else today, take this. I'll tell you how important this decision was. It put her in the right place because her lineage brings Jesus. And Jesus is born in Bethlehem of Judea. Folks, don't you ever minimize the decisions you make every day. They affect things you'll never know about, you'll never see, you'll never understand, but they're still important. Don't forget that. Second thing we see about Ruth is she makes the decision of faith. Of faith. Your people shall be my people. Look what she says. Your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord, and it's interesting, I'll talk about it in just a moment, do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. I want you to look in that text, in that verse 16 and 17, she refers to God, and it's capital G, and she says, my God, capital G, so it's talking about Jehovah, God. And then she says, may the Lord, and she, she pretty much says, you know what? Uh, I'll tell you what, if, if the Lord, if, if, I, if I change my mind, may the Lord bring judgment upon me. And look at the word Lord, capital L. She's referring to God. Pretty awesome. Hmm. She deserted her people to join Israel. She deserted her worship to trust Jehovah. She deserted her land to go to the promised land. And she made an oath before God and evoked judgment from God, called down judgment on herself if she did not keep her promise. You think she was serious? Absolutely. There's something to be said about this lady. 2 Corinthians tells us if anyone is in Christ, I told you a minute, he's a new creature. He's a new creation. She totally changed. And she begins to pursue God. So she has the decision of faith. And then we have a decision of fact. Verse 18, And when Naomi saw that she, talking about Ruth, was determined to go with her, she said no more. This is a matter of fact. Her decision was based 
on the, uh, or based on God, based on what she thought was right, and she wasn't going to change her mind. She even says she wasn't going to change her mind. And Naomi finally wises up and says, you know what, I think I'm stuck with her. It's interesting because the book of Ruth doesn't say anything about Naomi welcoming Ruth into the, the fold. We don't see that any place. In fact, as we go forward next week, we're going to see some more woe is me. <coughs> but I want you to notice something. Naomi is an Israelite that's in a foreign land. And Ruth is a foreigner getting ready to go back to the promised land. Do you see that? Who has the most faith in this story? Ruth. Ruth has the most faith. She stands out clearly. I mean, you don't have to be a theologian. You don't even, if you can read, you can see that. She is not giving up, and she's not giving in. And when Naomi sees that in verse 18, she just says no more. Ruth demonstrated her faith by just leaping over all the barriers. This is what I'm going to do. It's interesting because Matthew 16, 24 is that portion of scripture Jesus talking. He says there, if anyone, which would be anyone, come after me, let him just not deny himself and take up his cross and what? Follow me. Guess what Ruth did? She did it. And she's going to be a relative of Jesus because she's obedient. So I want to finish this morning with the question, where do you live? I'm talking spiritual. And if you didn't get the whole emphasis from the story about my dad, it was all about spiritual. Dad was no longer wanting to live the life of religion, but to live the life of Christ. And when he got saved, he went to Bible school, and he began to pastor and preach and so on and so forth. And anyway... So where do you live? I'm going to give you a couple points today. Number one, I just want to ask you point blank. Are you backslidden? Are you backslidden? You're a believer, but you've wandered off course. You're sideways in your life. You're living the life of a prodigal. You say nobody in this whole building knows it, but you know it. How about when you leave here? Would anybody in your life know you're a Christian? Because you know what? If you, if you don't have a testimony for Jesus, you're backslidden. I had a boss one time ask me a question, and he said, uh, I forget what the question was, but he asked me a question. And then right as he finished the question, he said, don't tell me God, because I believe in him too. I don't know what to tell you, because <laughs> it's all about him, amen, and I just, I said, it is about God, and uh, <clears throat> are you backslidden, are you wandering around out in the woods someplace, spiritually speaking, where do you live, some of us, spiritually speaking, we live in a pup tent, we just keep popping up every once in a while, we have no real root, we're not walking after God. We're not concerned about the things of God. We're not studying the word of God. If, you, if, you, if your life depended on your prayer life, your life would be over before the service is over because you don't talk to him at all. At all. In fact, when you get a prayer request from the church or from somebody, the first thing you want to do is know all about the prayer request, but you'll probably never pray for it because you're backslidden. Where do you live? Number two, are you even saved? If today was your last day on earth, would you be with Jesus or would you be like in hell? Are you religious or are you righteous? See, I have people tell me all the time, you know, uh, I'm not really into religion. You know what I tell them? Neither am I. All the religion in the world will get you right straight in the front door of hell. Because we need the righteousness of God in us. Through his son Jesus, that's what gives us permission to go to heaven. That's what gets those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
welcome. For many, many years, it doesn't really matter, but for many, many years, my password on my computer has been welcome. Because the best part was they used to put a little, like something underneath to remind you in case you forgot. And, under, and you, you get to write it out. So I used to put on there what Jesus will say to me. Because when I type welcome in my computer to start it, I think right away, I will be welcomed. Not because of Jim's righteousness or Jim's religion, but because of the righteousness of Jesus that he gave for me. So let me ask you a question. Are you in church or are you a part of the church? There are millions of people around the world today that are in church that aren't a part of the church. What do I mean? You mean to join this church? No, I'm talking about the church that Jesus is the head of, that has no denominational back, uh, boundaries. All you have to do is accept Christ as your Savior. You can be any religion in the world. The Lord may take you out of that, But being a Pentecost or a Baptist or a Bible church or a Catholic or a Jehovah's Witness, whatever, that's not going to get you to heaven. Jesus gets us to heaven. Are you saved? Number three, are you committed? You say, well, I do a lot of things here at, uh, at church. I'm not talking about being committed to the church, and although we should be, I believe. I'm talking about being committed in our trust with Jesus by faith. I am sold out to Jesus. No matter what he tells me to do, I'm going to do it. Is that your attitude? I want to look to him. I want to follow him. I'm looking for his return. I'm waiting any moment for him to come back. But in the meantime, I want to do my very, very best to follow him every step of my life. And when he says go, I want to be right up there going. And when he says stop, I want to be stopped. And when he says wait, I want to wait patiently. Are you committed to Jesus? Number four, are you willing to move? Now, I don't know too many people in this world that like to move. I surely do not like to move. But when it comes to spiritual things, we need to be ready to move. Move in a relationship. And so I want to give you three things today, and some of you have heard me preach for a lot longer period of time on these three things, but I want you to listen to them. They come out of 1 Corinthians. Paul says, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, that some are unsaved in the church. Paul says, there, Paul says to the church at Corinth, he's talking to the church at Corinth, and he says, some of you people here are lost. What does he say in, in uh, 2.14? The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. He says the natural person. He's talking about the, the unsaved person. He says they do not understand the things of the Spirit of God and, and because they, they see them as a joke, as, as folly. Have you ever talked to somebody and they're like, I'm not religious. I don't want to hear about God, blah, 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 blah. They're making fun of it. Paul says that's the unsaved people. There's people like that probably sitting here right now. That If, if Jesus came back today, you'd be left here. And Paul says, you don't understand the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. And he gives us another class of people sitting in that church way back in the, in the church at Corinth. And the church at Corinth had all issues. He, he gives us another group of people. He said, there's people here, some are unsaved, and some are carnal-minded. Some are carnal-minded. What did he mean by that? He means they're saved, but, but their thoughts, their mind, their activities, their purpose is not based anything on God it's based on what they want to do. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says in the, in the very beginning of the next chapter, these words, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. That means carnal, carnal people. As infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready. For you are still of the flesh. You're still carnal. Paul says, you know what? Here you are, a body of Christ, and you people are a bunch of little whiny babies. Not growing. Not, no wonder back in chapter 11, he says to them, some of you have died for misuse of the way you acted in the Lord's Supper. 
Paul says here, some of you are carnal minded. You really don't, you're saved and you're going to make it to heaven by the hair of your chinny chin chin, but this is important. I just read this week where they did an interview. Now, I am not into professional sports anymore, and I have a reason I'll explain another day, but anyway, I used to be. I was a, a sportsaholic. Uh, never was I an Eagles fan, okay? I'll just tell you that. But anyway, um, the Eagles, if the, they, did a, they went down and talked to people in Philadelphia that are Eagles fans, and they asked them, how many of you would skip your wedding to watch the Eagles play on the Super Bowl? 20% people said they would do that. Okay, okay, 18.5% said they would skip their child's birth. Okay, so let me ask you, what do you think they're worshiping? Yeah, not God. Yep, and, uh, and of course, some of you have already been planning on taking the Super Bowl Sunday off. Well, go ahead. Um, I believe, my dad taught me this, God can reach you wherever you're at. So if you take off from church to go to fishing on Sunday and the boat sinks, just say, Lord, help me. Okay, because he's probably there. So anyway, uh, so Paul says, some of you are carnal minded. You're so caught up in the things of the world. You, you really, and then he finishes up in chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. He says, some of you are spiritual. But that number's small. He says, the spiritual person judges all things. The spiritual person measures everything by God, by the word of God. First Corinthians 2. It says, but the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. No one can hold a candle to him. Why? Because they're not spiritual. Verse 16, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Who, who can sit down with you and instruct you if they're carnal or if they're natural? Unsaved people. They can't. And then he says, but we have the mind of Christ. The spiritual person is a person who puts on Jesus every day and pursues him. It's an interesting picture. It co goes along with what's happening here. Naomi, who knows better, doesn't do better. Orpah, who doesn't know better and should be being taught to do better, chooses to, to stay her own, the old way. And Ruth, who becomes a woman of faith that surpasses everybody else in this text. Amazing. So where do you live? You still live in a Moab? You know you're in sin. You know you need to get it right with God. But, and you have an exit plan. I mean, you have a possibility of getting out because you have Jesus. But, but you know, I just stay here. I like being here. Where do you live? Maybe this morning you live in Moab, but you're not even saved. You're like Orpah. You're, just, you're, you're, you're not willing to take the out that God gives us through his son, Jesus Christ. And you're just staying there. Or maybe this morning you're like, Naomi, you know better. Nothing's happening. It's not changing you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'd be the first to admit that me personally, and probably all of us, but me personally, needs to have a daily habit of moving towards you. Lord, forgive me. Forgive us for living in a place where we're happy, although we know without a doubt it's not where you want us to be. Lord, if there's someone here this morning that does not know you as Savior, I pray your spirit would work in their life so strong today. Because it says you came to seek and to save those who are lost. Lord, may they feel that draw, just like Dad did so many years ago. On a little road, headed down the road, realizes that he had to surrender his life to you. Lord, may they sense that today. May today be the day of their salvation. May they, even now, just bow their head right here in this room, right now, and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need you to save me, Jesus. And hallelujah, you promised to do just that. Thank you, Lord. Lord, if we're backslidden today, we're all over the road, we keep running in the ditch, 
Lord, help us today to surrender our life anew and afresh to you. Help us, Lord, to turn to you. Help us, Lord, to follow you. Lord, maybe we need to commit to something you're speaking to us about. Maybe we need to surrender something that you're telling us to do. Lord, whatever it is, I pray that today will be the day that we stand up and say, Lord, I surrender all to you, all of it. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I ask you today to work in our lives. Change us, I pray. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.